Okay, I think we will start now. So welcome everyone to this um, second day of this Zero Emissions Solutions Conference 2021, this virtual uh, side event of the COP26 in Glasgow today on the Pathfinder Initiative, Finding Pathways to a Healthy Zero Carbon Future. This is a, a really significant session, which is um, focusing in on one of the fundamental and perhaps most promising leverage points to accelerate and scale the transformation towards a safe and equitable zero carbon future for humanity by exploring the evidence between the links of mitigation pathways and healthy outcomes. So in that sense, um, this is really one of the, the content sessions on how to um, enable us to, to give a chance of a safe landing at well below two and aim towards 1.5. The Pathfinder Initiative is an international collaboration led from the, the London School of, of Health and Tropical Medicine in London. So we have experts um, very strongly engaged in science in leadership in this area from the London School. And it's, um, it's a privilege to, to be moderating this session with you. My name is Jan Rockström. I'm a professor in system science and then heading the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research, working very closely with, with Andy Haynes and colleagues on the Pathfinder Initiative. So not to lose any time because we should jump right into the, the content. Uh, th this conference is really about, you know, getting scientists, business, governments together with the uh, academia, civil society on, on a, a exploring and understanding much better how mitigation pathways give synergies or have trade-offs with health outcomes for humanity. And we would very much like to encourage you in this one and a half hour session to also come with your questions and your ideas. What are your experiences on opportunities, pathways and, and, and health co-benefits or concerns with regards to how mitigation pathways towards zero carbon have implications for health? And this may seem straightforward, but remember that we have uh, basically 150 years of conventional thinking that the fossil fuel driven modern industrial development has been the key towards positive health outcomes, while recognizing increasingly all the trade-offs we have with air pollutants and, and fossil fuel energy provision as being one of the major um, you know, threats towards human life expectancy. And now we are in this massive trend transformation point uh, to phase away from this uh, uh, you know over a century journey into the next step in in in, in human future on planet earth so this is uh, decisive and uh, looking forward to all the inputs we'll then have an open discussion please put your questions ideas in the chat we'll be seeding them through and picking them up so we have an open discussion in the second half and uh, with that, I'll just jump right into the presentations and we'll kind of, uh, the presenters will, will um, introduce themselves as we go along. So with that, I'd like to hand over to you, Andy. Andy Haynes will be giving the, the first presentation and uh, please, floor is your Andy. Well, thank you so much, uh, Johan, for the introduction. Let me just check that everyone can see my screen. Yeah, it looks good. Great. So thanks for the introduction. My name is Andy Haynes. I'm Professor of Environmental Change uh, and uh, Human Health at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And um, I'm going to be focusing really on some introductory remarks about setting the scene, which Johan has already, of course, begun to do. So I think we're increasingly aware that um, climate change has a range of different uh, impacts on human health. So it's one of the really overriding concerns as we move uh, into the next uh, decades. And so the implications of climate change for human health are really worrying. But what I'm going to talk about today is the other side of the coin. And that is that as we mitigate, as we cut greenhouse gas emissions, we can also produce near-term benefits to human health, as well as reducing the risks of dangerous climate change. And that's what we're going to focus on uh, this afternoon, the kind of opportunity story, if you like, from decarbonizing the world economy and improving human health. And this slide really summarizes some of the key issues. It reminds us that our transport systems are inefficient, they're polluting, 
They also encourage physical inactivity, sedentarism, which is a major risk factor for ill health, increases the risk of a whole range of non-communicable diseases like diabetes, heart disease, stroke, and so on. Uh, our energy systems, likewise, largely driven by, by fossil fuels, domestic energy in some countries also from burning solid biomass, which is very damaging to health. Our food system, responsible for perhaps 30% of greenhouse gas emissions, of course, as well as driving many of the other changes that are um, eroding uh, our planetary boundaries, water pollution um, uh, and uh, fresh water use, uh, indeed contributing to air pollution as well. So there's a lot that we can do in moving towards more sustainable energy, transport and food systems to reduce the emissions of greenhouse gases, but also uh, improve uh, human health. And we'll be talking uh, about some of those impacts uh, uh, as we move forward. So looking at the deaths linked to outdoor and household air pollution, WHO estimates around 7 million people dying prematurely every year from air pollution, both household, household often coming from burning of, of solid fuels, as I, I say, sometimes coal, but often uh, wood and other bio, uh, sources of biomass. And we know that uh, air pollution causes about uh, uh, a substantial number of deaths, a proportion of deaths from ischemic heart disease, from stroke, from pneumonia, which is a major killer of children, of course, from chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. That's where people have long-term difficulty uh, breathing because of damage to their lungs and also contributes to uh, lung cancer as well. So air pollution is a major driver of ill health and in moving towards a cleaner and more sustainable uh, economy, but we can benefit health in the near term. This is a study of a couple of years ago showing the contribution of fossil fuel burning to air pollution. And the map shows you where the premature deaths are particularly experienced. You can see that many of them are over China, Southeast Asia, uh, including Indonesia, uh, India, of course, much of Europe uh, and North America. Less so over Africa uh, because people currently burn more fossil fuels. But if Africa develops along a fossil fuel intensive pathway, then of course, those fossil fuel related air pollution deaths uh, will increase. So that reminds us really that um, there are big benefits to uh, reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions, fossil fuel in particular, but other sources as well. But those will differ according to the country. And so this slide just summarizes the different sources of air pollution. The US on the left, you can see that Power and traffic are major contributors, agriculture as well. And then on the right uh, is rather a contrast. You can see in the case of India that residential energy is a really important contributor. Other sectors uh, as well, but residential energy is an important um, contributor to air pollution. So <clears throat> air pollution strategies will need to vary according to the country, according to the sources of air pollution. Um, and uh, that will have implications for the policy choices that different countries uh, make. We also know that um, much of our burning of fossil fuels is driven by the fact that we don't pay the full economic costs of fossil fuel burning. So if we take the IMF definition of fossil fuel subsidies, that gap between existing and efficient prices, and those prices should include the costs of health and environmental damage, then these subsidies amounted to about $5.9 trillion in 2020, equivalent to about 6.8% of GDP. The explicit sub subsidies um, account for only about 8% of those, uh, and the implicit subsidies, in other words, those externalities, the failure to pay the full economic costs, uh, account for about 90%, something of that order. An assessment has suggested that efficient fuel pricing in, in, in the next four or five years could reduce global CO2 emissions to a level compatible with a 1.5 degree future, about 36% below baseline levels, and would also raise revenues substantially and prevent um, nearly a million local air pollution deaths. So that just gives you an example of what we could be doing to put ourselves on a healthier, more sustainable um, trajectory. So we know that cities are important drivers of greenhouse gas emissions because cities are responsible for around about 70 to 75%, something of that order, uh, economic activities based on fossil fuels and on other uh, ac human activities that contribute to climate change and air pollution. And a number of cities are taking the lead 
in moving towards a much more sustainable local economies. This is just uh, one, the city of Ivaskula, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, in Finland, which has this long-term development plan, which emphasizes six components, all of which are really relevant to human health, using renewable energy, sustainable transport, more walking, cycling, public transport, using waste as a resource, rather than um, burning it or discarding it, healthy, more sustainable food, valuable water, recycling water, using fresh water much more efficiently, and creating more sustainable, healthy communities that are better for mental and for physical health. And in that, in those ways, they aim to move towards a one planet ecological footprint within planetary boundaries and sustaining and enhancing the health of their population. The C40 um, the network of cities is also uh, very committed. Many of those mayors and civic leaders very committed to decarbonizing their economy and improving, uh, promoting and improving health. And a, a study done a couple of years ago through CDP showed that um, of those cities that were implementing uh, climate actions, climate mitigation actors, actions, those that uh, publicly uh, reported on and communicated the co-benefits were more likely to have greater ambition in their in their co-benefits um, and uh, to a minority a substantial minority of cities were not reporting the co-benefits of their actions co-benefits being the ancillary benefits of action so there's a wasted opportunity there we also know that uh, as i've said improving um, sustainable transport systems can benefit health both through reduced air pollution, but also through increased physical activity. This is a study we did a few years ago. Uh, it was a kind of thought experiment, if you like, looking at the implications of the urban population of England and Wales, if they could be persuaded to walk and cycle like the population of Copenhagen, which we know has very high levels of walking and cycling. And we estimated that over a period of, of 20 years, there would be quite substantial savings to our health system with something like uh, 25 uh, billion euros equivalent, something of that order over a 20 year period, due to reductions in diabetes, dementia, other conditions, which place a heavy burden on the healthcare system. We also know that exposing populations to um, green spaces can help to improve physical and mental health. And I think Penny will be talking about that in just a moment. This is the example of the super blocks in Barcelona where they've amalgamated city blocks, nine city blocks into one large block, reduced through traffic, planted more trees and vegetation, encouraging more walking and cycling and reducing air pollution. And they've estimated that if they could scale that up to the whole city, it would have substantial health benefits. So access to green space can improve uh, both physical and mental health. And the evidence is stronger in adults, but there's also emerging evidence in children as well. Our houses, houses can be made much healthier and more efficient. This is just a study we did some time ago in the, in the UK, looking at the benefits of retrofitting much of the UK's obs obsolete housing stock with more energy efficiency, double glazed windows, inner wall insulation, and so on. And we estimated about 5,000 premature deaths could be averted, 55 million tons of CO2 could be saved uh, as a result of those modifications. But there, there is um, an issue here that it's very important when you're re retrofitting houses, you have to ensure good ventilation, because if you just seal them up, you can actually have unintended adverse consequences by increasing household air pollution. So these policies need to be thought through in an integrated way. And food, of course, is a, is a crucial sector. And Johan himself has been very much involved in the Eat Lancet Commission. He may have time to say a few words about that later, perhaps in discussion period. But we do know that the food system is a major driver of climate change, as I've mentioned. Some of that's um, obviously contributed by livestock, which produces methane, of course, powerful greenhouse gas, also rice paddies as well. And we know that more plant-based diets have a much lower environmental footprint than those that are very meat intensive, particularly those with a lot of red meat. Um, so big benefits to health uh, and to the environment from moving towards predominantly a plant-based uh, diets. And then finally, in, in conclusion, the healthcare system itself, we are now recognizing the healthcare system, despite its commitment to improving human health, also contributes to pollution and to greenhouse gas emissions and thus to climate change. Probably between four and 5% of emissions overall around the world, in some countries more than that, like the US, for example. 
And if the global healthcare sector was a country, it would be the fifth largest emitter on the planet, according to this work done by Healthcare Without Harm. A number of healthcare systems now are committing themselves to net zero emissions. For example, the National Health Service in England by 2045, even for indirect emissions. And it's the indirect emissions through supply chains, which account for about 70% of emissions uh, in many countries. So you need to work not just with your energy suppliers, but also with the pharmaceutical and medical equipment um, industries. So uh, finally then the Pathfinder initiative, where does that fit into all this? Well, the Pathfinder initiative is really about capitalizing on these co-benefits, moving up beyond some of the important modeling exercises that have been done to document what happens when you put in place um, zero carbon, net zero carbon decarbonization strategies. It aims to accelerate the net zero transition by showing how well-designed policies and technologies can yield multiple benefits for people and the planet. And it, enables, it uh, aims to document the impact of implemented actions. Uh, the, it, it's summarized here, the partners, including C40, SDSN itself, OECD, CDP, and the Alliance for Health Policy and Systems Research, 16 commissioners from a wide range of disciplines and a network of champions to create a dedicated advocacy effort, co-chaired by Helen Clark, Joy for Mafia and myself, and funded by the Wellcome Trust with support from the Oak Foundation. And we invite you to submit your case studies using this link because we're very keen to learn from examples um, ar around the world. So I'll stop there. That's the Pathfinder Initiative. It aims to bring together, grade and prioritize existing evidence of what of the beneficial effects of decarbonization, collect these series of case studies to exemplify the issues that both the positive and negative issues and the challenges and the barriers and how these can be overcome and to synthesize guidance from shared learning with the outcomes, of course, being improved health, net zero targets and hopefully flourishing societies as well. I'll stop there, Johan, and I will hand over to the next speaker, Christine Belasova. Thank you so much, Andy. I, I, I lost you for a little moment there. I'm not sure if it was on my side, but um, uh, thanks for this incredibly um, comprehensive overview of where we are on, on the science and the evidence. I think it's quite a, uh, you know, quite mind boggling, not only the 5.9 trillion US dollars annually in direct and indirect subsidies that we are accepting from fossil fuel burning, but also cycle like uh, Dane in Copenhagen, and we can save 25 billion euros over 20 years in a, in a major UK city setting. So I think we, we're, we're talking of, of big leverage points here with regards to, to this transition. With that, we um, dig ourselves deeper into this topic with uh, Christine Belisova, also at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Over to you, Christine. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I'll speak in more detail about the pathways to improve public health and re reach net zero uh, target in cities. So as Andy already mentioned, cities are responsible for over 70% of energy related CO2 emissions. And in this graph, you can see the consumption side emission estimates for 13,000 cities. What you notice from this graph quite quickly is that the emissions across different cities are distributed very unevenly. And the highest emitting 100 cities account for around 18% of the global carbon footprint. So it appears that a decisive action by a very limited number of local governments can help make notable progress towards meeting climate change mitigation goals. To limit the average temperature increase to well below two degrees, CO2 and short-lived climate pollutant emissions would need to be reduced to net zero within the next 50 years. Some suggest that cities have to achieve this much earlier. And in this graph, you can see the suggestion from C40, Cities Climate Leadership Group, which is a group of 97 cities around the world, representing one quarter of the global economy. And they have estimated that to stay on the aspirational one and a half degree trajectory, C40 cities would need to achieve net zero emissions by 2030, unless we start using negative emission technologies. And that is in just nine years from now. So to reduce the emissions, we need to examine what are their sources. Emissions originate from most urban sectors, including transport, water supply, food, energy, and buildings. And these sectors are designed for urban dwellers' convenience and well-being. 
But depending on how they're designed, they often also exert pressures on the local and the global environment and sometimes pose risks to human health. But of course, we can take actions um, that, that can reduce carbon emissions within and across these sectors and, and at the same time help improve human health locally and globally. So what are some of these actions? Let's take the transport sector as an example. A recent scoping review looked for peer-reviewed and great literature on initiatives promoting low emission mobility. And they identified 108 initiatives globally. In the diagram, you can see the typology that they developed based on their results. And this typology is broadly classifying actions into sanctions that are more regulatory and incentives, which are softer, more motivational actions. Quite importantly, this literature review found that there is very little evaluation of the initiatives. In fact, changes in emissions as a result of the initiatives were evaluated only in only 31% of the um, studies that they identified. And these evaluations substantially differ in their quality. So for example, studies on sanctions such as congestion charges and restrictions are more likely to be evaluated in peer-reviewed analysis than um, incentives, the softer initiatives. So similarly, in other sectors, good quality evaluation studies of actions that are aiming to reduce emissions and improve health are quite limited. Green urban infrastructure is a good example of solutions that help contribute to both climate change mitigation and health. And in this graph, you can see how different green infrastructure approaches can help reduce heat island effect producing benefits at multiple scales. And of course, other benefits of green infrastructure include noise absorption, mental health benefits, space for physical exercise and social interaction, as well as environments that are conducive for children's cognitive development. But there are also negative impacts on health. For example, incre increased levels of allergies from certain tree species and potential safety concerns, depending on how the green space is designed. For example, um, a dark and quite intimidating park at night. Um, so an important question is not only what actions to take, but how do we design them in a manner that maximizes both climate change mitigation and health benefits in a holistic and synergistic manner? So one set of actions is unlikely to be sufficient to reach climate change mitigation targets. And therefore, we really need to think about packaged interventions. And when we think of those, it is important to consider what are their effects and how they will how the effects of different actions within the package will interact. Some actions have synergistic benefits. So for example, improved physical accessibility to amenities can help people access services for health and well-being more easily, but at the same time also reduce the need for travel, therefore saving energy. But there can also be trade-offs. So for example, compact urban development can come in conflict with the availability of space for urban parks, opportunities for passive dwelling design, and for renewable energy production. So when we're talking about packaged interventions, we have to ask the question, what has been attempted at the city scale so far? And you may have heard the visionary ideas of eco cities. Mazda City is an example of such a vision. It had the vision to become the world's first zero carbon, zero waste city with 30,000 residents and 50,000 commuters. Its buildings would be subjected to very stringent sustainability standards aiming to reduce the embodied carbon and achieve high energy and water efficiency. In 2006, the Abu Dhabi government announced that it will spend 22 billion US dollars to build the city by 2016. To date, only 10% of the city has been developed and the completion date has been pushed back to 2030 with further funding reductions down to only 10 uh, billion US dollars. So it is quite unclear how a city like Mazda will function in practice. And of course, it's not only about building new cities. For most city, cities, the challenge is to transform their current infrastructure and social makeup to meet the net zero targets. So when we are... Um, so one of the best performing cities at the moment is Copenhagen. From 2005 uh, to 2018, Copenhagen has reduced its CO2 emissions by more than 40%. And it has the goal to become uh, CO2 neutral by 2025. But it hasn't always been a smooth road for Copenhagen. They had a number of emission reduction targets set, for example, for 2010 and 2015. The 2010 target wasn't achieved. 
um, the 2015 target um, was on the contrary overachieved. So Copenhagen in total has um, planned and implemented over 165 initiatives. The city has very high overall implementation performance, both in terms of the changes in the energy supply and the emission reductions. And it is really moving at an impressive pace towards its uh, climate neutrality target for 2025. If we zoom out of just one example of Copenhagen, we can see that actually over 100 cities are now reporting that at least 70% of their electricity is coming from renewables. Over 40 cities are currently operating on 100% renewable electricity, but that is just one aspect the emissions from the energy supply. And there are many other sources of emissions that cities have to tackle. And with many emissions, um, we are really depending on our own consumption uh, patterns. So how can cities transform to meet the net zero target? Colleagues and I developed a framework for achieving urban transformation for health and sustainability, which you can see on the slide. The framework is emphasizing the importance of close collaboration between the city government, the private sector and people living in the city. And the key mechanisms for transformation are governance, urban planning and infrastructure, technological and social change, scientific evidence and its co-production as well as the behavior change. So one of the most dramatic reductions in greenhouse gas emissions and air pollution that we have seen so far was in 2020, as many countries went into lockdown in response to the COVID-19. People have drastically changed their lifestyles in response to the virus. And when habits are temporarily disrupted, people are much more sensitive to new information and they may adapt a mindset that is more conducive to behavior change. The urgency of having to make these changes in response to the pandemic has helped us overcome some of the barriers that we used to have against active travel and against reducing the consumption of non-essential goods and perhaps traveling less internationally. And this could provide a momentum to lock in the behavior changes that benefit health and the environment and might catalyze a shift from a consumerist culture to a much more sustainable economy. So translating these temporary behavior changes into a permanent culture change could be supported through the development of new infrastructure, such as converting roads into pedestrian and cycle lanes, new policies, including incentivizing more flexible working from home, virtual meetings, medical cons consultations, and less long distance travel. City governments in Mexico City, Bogota, New York, Milan, Paris, Berlin, and London have implemented such measures. And although some cities um, only use the policies and the infrastructure during the response to COVID-19, and unfortunately these measures were temporary, in other cities, these measures remained permanent, for example, in Paris and Milan, and many more cities should really follow their example. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Christine. I think this was uh, an incredibly rich overview of uh, scalable solutions at city level. I think the C40 initiative uh, reaching uh, a net zero point already in nine years time is, uh, is just pointing the direction of, of how cities can be leverage points for, for this transition towards healthy zero carbon future development. And, and as you point out, there's so much evidence here that we have, I mean, if there's any space where we have really significant co-benefits it's it's in the urban settings for for urban dwellers Thank, thanks for that so with that we um jump on to nature-based solutions with uh, penny mirage and um uh, over to you penny thank you very much can i confirm everyone can hear me and see my screen yes we see it looks good Thank you very much for the introduction, Johan. So I'll be talking about uh, my work on nature-based solutions within the Pathfinder Initiative and really try to showcase how nature-based solution can help us achieve multiple societal benefits, including carbon mitigation, their carbon mitigation potential. So I'll start off with a, a brief definition of what NBS approaches are, and this is coming from the International Union of Conservation for Nature. And NBS really are actions that protect or sustainable, so sustainably manage nature or restore our natural ecosystems. And the whole idea here is that they, they enhance nature, but at the same time address 
multiple societal challenges, uh, and not just on in health, but also economic challenges, challenges including livelihood challenges and also environmental challenges. And typically when we think of MBS, we think of kind of three broad but interrelated categories, as you can see at the bottom of that screen there. So type one uh, approaches are, 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 are typically um, approaches where we leave the natural environment intact, but continue to generate our ecosystem services benefits from those. And you can see at the bottom of the screen there, an example is when we leave our wetlands uh, or mangroves forest intact. And the second one really is where there's a little bit more uh, uh, intervention or human engineering. And a, and a good example of this is where we uh, uh, agroforestry techniques, where we intentionally integrate trees and vegetation in croplands and, and, and grazing lands. It's very popular in Africa, in Asia, and I'll be telling you a little bit more about that. And the type three is really the generation of new ecosystem. Um, and, and a really good example here is when we, we create a new ecosystem such as green roofs in urban areas. I think it's really good to cover the ground of what NBS are and what uh, they are not. Um, and IUCN uh, have come up with eight principles that define uh, NBS approaches. I'll only discuss four today because I think that the, the four key ones and, and also because of the time limit. So the first one is that all NBS approaches should respect cultural and ecological rights. And this, and what I mean by that is the is respecting the cultural um, rights of particularly from indig indigenous communities or of native communities. And when that's not respected, there's a little bit of a pushback from indigenous groups who feel that their, their natural environment is being used to address uh, challenges that they never contributed to in the first place. As you can see in the top uh, part of the screen there, there's a little bit of a, of a pushback from several ind indigenous communities who think that uh, their nature is not part of, of our solution. The second one is that they should be fair or, or implemented in a fair and equitable way that promotes transparency and broad participation. So no one is left behind essentially. And the, the third one is, and which is really core to all NBS approaches is that they should maintain biological and cultural diversity. So this is the idea of about enhancing biodiversity and the ability of ecosystems to evolve over time. And the fourth one is that they need to be applied at large scale. At the bottom of the screen there, I've given an, an example of what NBS are not or, or what, uh, what does not cover NBS approaches. So interventions that include uh, monoculture, single sporic uh, uh, species, uh, including uh, plantations such as palm oil plantations, they might have uh, carbon mitigation benefits, but they don't fall under the umbrella of NBS because they're not good for biodiversity and they have other harmful um, effects. So in this slide, I just want to showcase how NBS have been uh, increasing in, in popularity. And, and these are uh, examples of, of papers and reports that have, have been emerged over the last few years. And in the following slide, I'll try and summarize why I think NBS have gained so much popularity in the last uh, um, few decades or, or few years. The first one is that they're very low cost. This is an example on, on the picture on the left-hand side there shows an example of a natural uh, flood mitigation solutions versus an, an engineered solution. And you can see why we consider them low cost. And that image there on the top shows an example of mangrove forest, I think it's in Indonesia. So they have multiple benefits such as flood protection and, 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 and also act as storm barriers. And the second thing is that they support fisheries which safeguards food and nutritional security a lot of coastal population rely on, uh, on fish as a, as a source of protein. In fact, probably the only source of protein. So it's important that, that we ensure that uh, they, they have food and nutritional security. And the third one is that they generate income and, and in income is generated uh, uh, from fisheries, but also from sales of timber products generated from the mangroves. And the third one is that they enhance biodiversity. And just quickly showing you another example of, of NBS. One of the things that, that's highlighted on in, uh, from NBS approaches is that they help us achieve multiple sustainable development goals. And I like using this example here of agroforestry techniques uh, popularized, uh, particularly in Africa and in Asia, 
And this is where um, farmers in particular in intentionally integrate uh, trees, vegetation and shrubs in agricultural landscapes. There are numerous benefits in terms of health, economic, but also the environmental benefits, including uh, the reduction in soil erosion, uh, improvement in soil fertility, and some of the social economic benefits include uh, higher crop yields, so increased agricultural productivity, which is really good for maintaining food and nutritional security. And as you can imagine, better water catchment, which has associated health benefits, such as uh, improved water and sanitation benefits. Trees are also really good for in, in terms of income generation, uh, and farmers then have a little bit of a surplus when they sell their, their food. Um, they also improve um, uh, enhanced microclimates, which uh, supports uh, um, or improves the, the environment of, of the outdoor agricultural workers by providing shading, for instance, and also several uh, biodiversity benefits. And just to highlight another example, this one coming from cities, is that NBS are increasingly used uh, um, to, to promote uh, climate resilience, particularly in cities. You've heard this from the previous speakers. Um, in particular, NBS are increasingly used as, uh, for flood mitigation, and also in terms of cooling uh, urban cities, uh, where they mitigate against the effect of urban heat islands. Uh, imp improved uh, air quality, uh, again associated with, uh, with NBS and in trees and vegetation. And the one I wanted to highlight is the reduction in energy cost. And this is uh, some figures coming from the Chicago Green Roof uh, that was implemented, I think, in, in, at the turn of the, of, in the beginning of 2000, I think. And some, some, and some estimates of how much um, that particular building, the running cost has declined, the estimates are between 3,000 to 5,000 annually. And this is just from the implementing green roofs at the Chicago Green Hall. And the other, other one that you've heard from my previous speakers is increase in physical activities. Uh, so uh, the image on the top there shows an example of a green corridor. And when these are imp implemented in urban areas, uh, citizens then can use those spaces for running or cycling or walking, which, is, which has demonstrated um, health impacts. And not just physical health, but also mental health impacts. And the last one I want to highlight is the NBS uh, potential in, in terms of carbon mitigation. This is a little bit of a busy slide, but I'll try and talk you through it. So the graph there comes from a seminal report that came from uh, Griscom and, and colleagues back in 2017. And what they did is they came up with 20 distinct NBS or what they call NCS, natural climate solutions that can help mitigate CO2 from the atmosphere. And so that's the green part. So the green part is, is, is how NBS can help us mitigate. And the gray part there is how we can mitigate um, carbon emissions through decarbonization. And so some of the things I wanted to highlight is that um, NBS have the potential of mitigating between 30 to 37% of carbon emissions. Some of the um, approaches that I mentioned earlier, such as trees and croplands have been shown to be very effective. And, and also coastal wetland restoration, restoration in terms of um, um, the creating blue carbon reservoirs. But really to highlight the fact that NBS cannot replace decarbonization. So we need both. And just to conclude maybe uh, with a word of caution about um, when NBS are wrongly implemented, they can reach, lead to some unintended consequences and, and indeed some damage. And this is a quote uh, from that book that I, I was, I was really recently saying that the wrong tree in the wrong place can do a lot of damage. And an example of some, some of that damage include depleting uh, water tables. And on the right hand side, you can see an example of, of, of invasive species that have been um, introduced in, in South Africa that have led to drying up uh, uh, riverbeds. So it's just to caution that um, NBS are good, that they're exciting, and they present a lot of opportunities, but they need to be properly implemented. I think I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Peninha. This was, uh, you know, adding a very, very essential dimension in the whole health climate transition. And I think it's so important your, your you know, sharing your experience on the fact that we need to define nature-based solutions and to do that in a very robust 
strict way because as you point out it's a, it's a very popular term it is uh, picked up by businesses and cities and big institutions like the international energy agency and beyond and then we need to distinguish between um, biodiversity rich uh, indigenous community anchored mbs solutions versus uh, initiatives that cannot be be qualified as as mbs like for example as you refer to uh, big monoculture systems for example which may be sequestering carbon but are not at all delivering on on uh, on on the other key criteria that are, that are required I, I look forward to coming back to this in terms of also the health the health go benefits of, of nature-based solutions that might be a part of our conversation uh, with that um, the final talk before opening up for a broader discussion uh, so over to you Sirin Hassan um, I should also say that Sirin is, is also involved in the Pathfinder initiative like all the previous speakers as well so we're here kind of covering the rich content of all the knowledge generation that that are, are being you know delivered into the Pathfinder initiative and I know that you have some exciting case studies as well so over to you. Uh, thank you, Johan. Um, so my, I work on this part of the Pathfinder initiative, uh, which focuses on actions that um, have been implemented in the real world and have demonstrated benefits for both mitigation and health. So in the past six months, uh, we've been searching published as well as gray literature, and we also had a call for evidence supported by our partner organizations. And so far we identified about 20 studies uh, that span energy, uh, urban infrastructure, diets, and agriculture. Um, not all were large scale. Some were implemented nationally and had large impacts while others uh, were only local interventions. Um, so I'm going to give you now a few examples of what we found. So um, in this example, um, Milstein and colleagues uh, aim to quantify the benefits from solar and wind power generation, which replaced uh, coal and natural gas plants in the US. And as you can see, the generation from um, these sources increased considerably between 2007 to 2015, which resulted in economic benefits in the range of about 30 to more than 100 billion US dollars mostly from um, about 3,000 to almost 13,000 avoided premature deaths from improved air quality, as well as 147 million tons of avoided carbon dioxide emissions. And 58% of all of this non-hydroelectric renewable electricity capacity built in the US in the last 20 years was used to meet state renewable portfolio standards. And this means that these standards require electricity load serving entities or electric companies, in other words, um, to meet a growing portion of their load with eligible forms of renewable electricity. And these standards exist in 29 US states as well as Washington DC. So in another paper, um, the authors looked at the impact of complying to this standard for one of the years during this time period, which was 2013, and they quantified other health benefits as well, such as emergency department and hospital admissions for respiratory and cardiovascular diseases. And as you can see here, the greatest benefits um, occurred to the eastern half of the country, and that's because there were higher emitting fossil plants there that were displaced, and population densities are also higher. So um, another example comes from China, uh, where two cities in the Habai province, uh, Baoding and Longfang, are now coal-free. There are approximately uh, more than one million wall-mounted uh, natural gas stoves that have been installed for rural families in those cities to replace coal use. And these were just typical uh, low pressure boilers um, and the natural gas supply um, that was supplied by the local gas companies had to meet requirements for Chinese national standard, which included needing to be less than 1% of carbon monoxide and less than 2% of carbon dioxide content. 
And as you can see here um, in this graph, there was an almost 100% reduction in uh, particulate matter levels, which resulted in a total of 6,000 avoided premature deaths in the two cities. There were also about a 35 to 55% uh, reduction in carbon dioxide and uh, 70 to 80% of methane emissions. And that's just in one winter heating season. One gap in this study is that, as you can see here, there's a difference in these outcomes between the two cities, but the study focused on reporting impact and doesn't explore these variations. Um, another example I wanted to show is this intervention that was done in, in, in Indonesia. And here, uh, clinic discounts or vouchers were given to villages based on community-wide reductions in illegal logging activity, which were using, and illegal logging was used, the, the funds from that were used to meet healthcare costs. So the, the purpose of this intervention was to offset these healthcare costs from illegal activity. So um, there were also conservation and education programs, as well as alternate livelihood uh, training. And this took place in around 73 villages around a large 900 kilometer square national park, 13% of which was already lost to, log to illegal logging activity between uh, 92 and 2004. So the intervention led to um, increased healthcare access of more than 28,000 patients with the highest frequency occurring um, in participating communities. Um, there were also declines in, uh, disease, in some diseases, such as malaria, TB, childhood diseases, and um, diabetes. And there was a 70% reduction in annual forest loss in that 10 year where the study took place compared to a synthetic control. Um, and, that, and 590 kilotons of carbon dioxide emissions were averted due to the averted loss of 27 kilometer square forest. What's nice about this study is that it described how the intervention was designed, which was through extensive engagement with the local community to understand their needs. So the um, NGO that was behind this intervention undertook about 400 hours of focus groups with 500 members and leaders in the community to understand why illegal logging was happening in the first place. The one gap, however, is that it doesn't provide insight into the implementation of the intervention. For example, what went well, what didn't go as planned, or what adaptations were necessary. Um, so I wanted to also talk about this intervention, which was uh, occurred on city level. Um, and it was New Zealand's model community program. And this was mainly an investment from both local as well as central government in infrastructure to improve active travel networks and education as well as promotion campaigns. So a quasi-experimental study over the years of um, 2011 to 2013 was conducted to evaluate whether it, this intervention was successful in moving away from motorized modes. And the study found a 30% increase in active trips, which equated to 5% decrease in motorized trips. And that translates to a reduction of about 1,000 tons of CO2 emissions and uh, 34 avoided disability adjusted life years, as well as two avoided deaths. And a disability adjusted life year or a DALI is a measure of the burden of disease. So which is basically the sum of the years of life lost due to premature mortality, as well as the years lived with a disability. So one DALI represents the loss of the equivalent of one year of full health. And just as a thought exercise, um, if we took the total population of New Zealand, um, which is 5 million, and we focused on the population that is between 15 to 65 years of age, 87% of which live in urban areas, we have around 2.6 million people that would be the target of this intervention. And if it was scaled up to, to all of New Zealand targeting the, this population, we, we would have a reduction of 20 kilotons of carbon dioxide. And as you can see here, this is a very small amount uh, in comparison to other actions that have potential for much larger reductions, such as uh, the example we saw in um, the two cities in China. But the benefit cost ratio of this intervention 
um, as estimated by a cost benefit analysis that was done by the authors was due to its health gains and injury reduction as well as emission reduction. So this could be even higher as well if you take into account other benefits such as congestion or noise reductions. Um, finally, I wanted to talk about this uh, local small scale example just to show you a contrast of, of something that is happening on a local level. And this intervention aimed to uh, reduce the carbon footprint of school meals while retaining the same food supply and recommended nutritional value of the meals. This took place in only three or four uh, schools in Sweden, and um, it was only over a four week period. So as you can see, there was a reduction in 28 to 40% of carbon dioxide equivalents, depending on the baseline meal. And just a small, another small thought exercise, just to see what these benefits might be if it was scaled up um, to 1 million children that live in Sweden that are between four to 14 years of age and about 200 days in the school year. So if we were to assume this reduction across all ch children throughout the entire academic year, we are looking at about 40 million to 66 million kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalents per year. And just to, as um, just one last thing to highlight is um, the National Health Service in England, which was successful in reducing carbon dioxide emissions from healthcare uh, between 1990 and 2019. So um, there was a reduction of 26%, and a major contribution of uh, contributing to this reduction is from the energy system and uh, with a reduction of about 64% just from building energy alone. During this period, uh, the population of England actually increased by 17% and the provision of care doubled with health spending more than tripled. And as you can see here, um, the reduction in total emissions was not cons consistent uh, throughout over these years but the carbon intensity of the NHS reduced by 37% of uh, carbon equivalents per capita and 64% per inpatient finished admission episode, which is defined as a single inpatient admission in the year. Um, so just to close with some final messages, um, as, as we saw in the range of examples I've presented here, um, the magnitude of the benefits will depend on the type as well as the scale of the intervention. And in order to address this climate change crisis and also realize their health benefits, the health benefits of these interventions, we need actions that are transformative. And also um, for those that are happening on a small scale to really have an impact, they need to be scaled up. And this may sound obvious, uh, of course, but the point here is that we need better evaluations. Um, the evidence that we found so far is limited in two ways. Uh, first, the evaluations of implemented real world actions usually measure either mitigation benefits or health benefits, but often not both. And second, those that we have found um, in this case, we're focusing on measuring impact only. There were missed opportunities to understand the process side of things, which includes implementation and contextual factors that interfere or help in realizing these benefits and therefore can help in the scale up or the transfer of these actions into other contexts. And the last point I want to make is that um, often what we see in the published or even the gray literature are example of successful interventions or actions. There's a lot of value and knowledge in those that were not successful, but unfortunately we don't have access to these experiences because they're either not written up in sufficient detail or not made publicly available. So perhaps there needs to be a drive to encourage publications of lessons learned from unsuccessful interventions as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Serene, and thanks everyone for these talks. I think your, your final action-oriented overview here, Serene, was, was really important for us and it just, I mean, I think you, you you put you know your your head right right on the on you, you nailed it. Uh, finally, reminding us that one of the key entry points for the Pathfinder initiative is this conclusion that we have a lot of studies on mitigation. 
We have a lot of started on, on health inter, uh, impacts, but we have so limited studies that are looking at the combined interactions between climate mitigation and health outcomes, both positive and negative. And this is what we need to really map out in, in, in a much more prominent way. And I think just, just your Chinese example here with going to uh, uh, low pressure boilers with, with, uh, with uh, LG gas, how that both gives co-benefits for mitigation, but also over 6,000 reduction of 6,000 premature deaths. And, uh, and I think these are you know, really fundamentals. And and as a Swede, you you quickly pass through this uh, uh, children's school example. But ju just just to remind everyone who's on this call that 40 to 60 million carbon dioxide equivalents reduction as a thought experiment, if every child in Sweden would be eating a healthy diet in school, that is actually equivalent to the all the reported domestic emissions from Sweden to the United Nations Framework Convention here in Glasgow, which is roughly 50 million. So we're talking about big, you know, big uh, cumulative outcomes if, if you start taking local success on climate and health and scaling it up to the city or to the national level. So we're, we're I mean, it's, it, it's small at, at the local level, but it really adds up to, to big, big impacts at the larger scale. With that, um, we have um, ample time, actually, half an hour for a joint uh, discussion across, um, you know, all these topics. And I'd really encourage everyone who's participating to uh, come in with, with questions, uh, comments, uh, ideas, concerns, pointing at the directions forward. Um, I'd like to, to start with, um, I see that there are two questions kind of hanging here from, from the start. And if I could take those, and I, and I see that you may actually help also here, Sarah, and, and please join in on, on this. And I'll just throw this question out to anyone in the panel. So it's Amanda Quintana asking, what, what are the panelists' thoughts about how we can go about assessing, revamping existing national local health adaptation plans to incorporate mitigation and adaptation actions? And I think this is quite an interesting question because our experience, as you remember, Andy, is that you know we have we have dietary guidelines in many countries, but those dietary guidelines are only about health. They have nothing to do with sustainability at all. And and, and what are your thoughts, anyone on the panel, on on you know how do we develop guidelines, or, or do you have example of uh, of national guidelines that that integrate health and climate, or is this uh, is this a, is this a gap, a global gap, and you know, that. If that is the case, then we have quite some work to do. Anyone would like to pick that up? Andy. Well, uh, shall I start and then my colleagues can, can jump in? Um, yeah, I think it's a, great, it's a great question. I think there are two issues here, well, a number of issues. One is about adaptation and mitigation. And we tend to think of those in kind of separate silos. So the adaptation community often doesn't talk to the mitigation community and so on. Uh, I think increasingly we need to integrate adaptation and mitigation. It isn't, you know, in, in order to uh, avoid unintended adverse consequences, in order to capitalize on potential synergies. Let me give an example. I mean, we can adapt to some extent to extreme heat exposure by installing a lot more air conditioners. That will have big implications for energy use, for fossil fuel burning, for local air pollution. It will increase the urban heat island effect because you've got to pump the air, the hot air somewhere. And so uh, just basing uh, an adaptation initiative or strategy on increased air conditioning is gonna have all sorts of adverse consequences. And so it means that we need to think about ways of reducing heat exposure that don't require a large amount of energy. That would be passive cooling, for example, of buildings, cool roofs, shutters, shading of buildings uh, and so on, and passive ventilation. So that's just one example of the need to integrate mitigation uh, and, and adaptation. The, the second point is about guidelines. And these are important, you know, in clinical medicine, when I was a clinical practicing doctor, you know, we increasingly in a complex world, one relies on state of the science guidelines. You don't just, you know, it, it, traditionally doctors used to just practice the way they thought it was fit. But now in a complex world, you need the synthesis of the best available evidence to inform your clinical practice. And it's the same with climate change and, and planetary health. We do need guidance about how to uh, implement actions around adaptation and mitigation best, based on the best available scientific evidence, which currently, of course, is often suboptimal. 
But the way to increase the quality of the evidence, of course, is to increase the demand for evidence. And then, of course, people start to improve the quality of it uh, in, in a sort of semi-continuous way. We do have some examples. There are a few examples of uh, national dietary guidelines which incorporate sustainability, but they're relatively few, and it's not quite clear to what extent they're being implemented. But uh, I think the question is absolutely right. We need to develop uh, better guidelines, better evidence to inform those guidelines. And very importantly, we need to have an implementation strategy for the guidelines. You can have guidelines that sit on a shelf and are never implemented. So you need to really uh, build implementation in right from the outset. But let me ask, pass over to my colleagues to see if they've got any additional comments. Yeah, so please jump in, anyone who feels, I see, Perenia, are you? Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was, I was, it was just a really brief ad addition. And just, just to say, I don't have any examples of national guidelines, but I think nature-based solutions are, have the potential to meet both <coughs> education and mitigation uh, uh, benefits. I think I highlighted that on my talk. So where trees and vegetation and, and also they, they, they form really good vital carbon sinks, but at the same time deliver uh, adaptation benefits, particularly for rural uh, farmers or rural households that are really, really connected with the land. So it's, it's a, it's a re I think it's an opportunity that we need to draw on a little bit more. You know, I, I fully agree. Yes, Christine. Sure. I'd like to just add that we definitely have to think about um, adaptation in terms of the upstream actions that we can take. A lot of adaptation considerations <laughs> have been um, in the health sector, at least, around how do we ensure sufficient hospital capacity under changing climate, etc. But it's way much more about how do we actually prevent people from getting into the hospital because of climate change in the first place? How do we ensure that they have resilient livelihoods? How do we ensure that they don't get infected with increasing uh, prevalence of infectious diseases? How do we tackle the transmission factors? How do we improve lifestyles? And I think a lot of that can be definitely tied to the mitigation actions, but we definitely have to understand what are the impact pathways of the actions that we're implementing, of the strategies and policies more widely. So there's lots and lots to be done about the complex um, understanding of the impacts and, and the complex pathways of impact. Yeah, no. No, thanks. And, and I fully agree. And, and just to say also that I think it fits very well in, in this session as well, your point, Andy, and I think it's really supported by, by your statement here, Christine, that we, we are beyond the point where we can deal with climate and health separately, but we're certainly also beyond the point where we can deal with mitigation and adaptation separately. I mean, I increasingly talk of um, zero carbon adaptive management, meaning that we have to you know, invest in, in building resilience, having adaptive capacities, yes, but it has to be done in ways that give multiple outcomes for zero carbon development, for health, for Peninha's point about nature-based solutions that give multiple benefits. I mean, as you say, both adaptive management, resilience, mitigation, and, and uh, scoring on both health and uh, basic uh, basic livelihood outcomes and i think that's we we're, we're, we haven't been good enough in really mapping these properly um i mean i i'm kind of keen to ask you andy actually and that is almost unfair in a session like this because it perhaps is more a kind of a bilateral thing but but to be honest i i mean you you raised the numbers so you triggered me here that you know i find it i'm i mean i'm not a health professional so what i'm stating now is really coming as a nurse system scientist might even be unethically put so please correct me here if if you feel i'm 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 walking into some deep corner here but but you point out that 7 million people die prematurely each year because of air pollution caused by unsustainable fossil fuel burning well COVID-19, a disaster, is also a premature death of up till today, roughly 4 million people. I mean, it's a complete disaster, but it's also premature death. I mean, it's people dying too early compared to their normal life expectancy. I mean, looking at it coldly, I would say these are completely comparable. I mean, it's 7 million versus 4. It's, it's the equivalent scale of, a, of unacceptable outcome. How can it be that we accept that every year we have a COVID-19 equivalent disaster just occurring under the radar year after year after year? Or am I somehow pulling this too far? 
No, it's a, it's a very important point you're making, Johan. I, just to clarify, though, the 7 million deaths that WHO, that the estimate WHO uses, is a combination of ambient air pollution, much of which is fossil fuel. That's right, of course. And also household air pollution. Now, household air pollution is partly, it used to be coal, because a lot of people were burning coal in, in homes in China, that's less so now, but also a biomass, you know, wood, dung, and so on, other, other solid fuels. So it's a combination of different sources. But overall, it, it is a big burden and um, it is unacceptable. The point is, it's, it's a rather silent burden, isn't it? We don't sort of see it in such an obvious way. We don't see intensive care units full of people suffering from air pollution. They have to from heart attacks, their stroke, uh, pneumonias and so on. So the label air pollution is not necessarily on them. So the public's not always, and indeed the, the health professionals are not always aware that air pollution is an important risk factor in, in these cases. But I think that awareness is growing rapidly. So I do think on the positive side of what you're saying is that because we can now say uh, there are big benefits in the near term to moving towards a, a zero carbon economy, that can make policy change and implementation more attractive uh, to, to the public. Uh, and that's what we have to capitalize on. Not just air pollution, though, but also healthier diets, increased physical activity, and some of the benefits of green space exposure as well. So it's the whole argument, as you were pointing out, the argument of multiple benefits from policies that increasingly, I think, has to be a kind of guiding star for, for public policies. We should be looking for multiple benefits from the policies that we're, we're implementing. And in that way, we can help to scale up and, and get much more public support and hopefully also uh, shift uh, decision makers towards making the right decisions uh, in a timely fashion. Yeah, and, and, and while we are on the kind of COVID track, uh, Taskinul Huda Saqib has come in with uh, with a question. Uh, it goes as follows: Regarding the marginalized people, like refugee camps, small island communities, etc., how we could successfully implement revived revived health policies, especially for those um, especially those adopted after COVID breakout. I don't know if any one of you have any thoughts on on what actions would be required in the in the most vulnerable settings in the world um any thoughts there i don't know if any of my colleagues want to jump in but, but shall i have a quick go and then they can yeah, jump please go in. ahead um so yeah i mean this is a really crucial issue i mean it, it, it's something which is uh, obviously made worse by climate change, but climate change is not the only factor. Many other factors are causing marginalization of populations, in, in, including you know, conflict and a range of other factors. So it's partly about improving the kind of delivery of healthcare to these marginalized populations. And I think that more resilient health systems can play a very important role in that. So health systems that are based on, on primary care, which is was my sort of background, so very much working in the community to deliver resilient healthcare systems that don't necessarily depend on, on high technology, but can deliver a lot of the vital interventions that are required for population health. So strengthening primary care uh, is, is gonna be really important for addressing these marginalized uh, populations. But also, uh, of course, climate change mitigation and adaptation are crucial because we know that if we don't act quickly, that there'll be more marginalized populations. We know that people will be displaced by floods, droughts, increasingly difficult to work because of extreme heat. So there are important interlinkages between these marginalized populations, the increased risk to these marginalized populations and climate change adaptation and mitigation. So certainly we need these climate resilient net zero emission health systems can help to address some of these interlinked uh, challenges. Yeah, thanks. Any other? Oh, no, yeah. yeah, just a quick one on, on, on COVID. I think one of the benefits of COVID, if I can call it a benefit, is that, that the fact that it unified many, many different perspectives and many people combined effort to work together so and, and, and mobilize international responses. So it's really how we can capitalize on, on the momentum created by COVID in solving some of the other issues. Uh, a really good example is, is, is how quickly we were able to generate vaccines and just remember that there are so many other diseases air areas, particularly neglected tropical diseases that require similar global efforts. And I think COVID showed that, that we can do it and maybe we should continue doing that. Yeah, thanks. So here comes um, a, a big and complex question from, from Dennis Caro and, and backed up by, by Chip Pitts. So, um, 
very interesting presentations. If I may, how do you change people's behaviors and the focus on consumption driven economics? And, and, and Chip kind of fills this in by adding the whole dimension of, uh, of misinformation that, that um, pollutes very much of, of efforts of trying to really share. So, I mean, you pointed out, Andy, that uh, only a fraction of countries have even even national dietary guidelines or any health guidelines. Well, that's one challenge that we don't even have the information systems in place. But then even if we have them, we have difficulties in, in reaching out with, uh, with, with the kind of the science as, as we understand it. What, what are your reflections on, on how do we address this? How do we accelerate understanding of health, climate interactions? Andy. Well, it's, it's a very big question that's been posed and we could have several conferences just trying to answer those really important and complex questions. Um, let me just quickly address behavior change. Well, it's impossible to do it quickly, but at least touch upon it. So I think what the um, behavior change researchers tell us is that many of the decisions and behaviors that we have are, are in a sense, almost automatic. Um, we, we get up and we're cued by certain automatic cues to have performed certain behaviors. We, we act according to our routines and so on. And so one of the challenges is how to make the right, the, the climate neutral, the, the carbon mitigation uh, decisions, the easy decisions. And of course, there's various ways we can do that. One, of course, is by pricing policies. So, you know, if we have adequate carbon taxes, as long as they're not regressive, as long as they're pro-poor, they have to be recycled to ensure that they're progressive, then that could help to make some of these choices easier. But as we know, there are major political barriers to implementing carbon pricing for all sorts of, of, of reasons. So the other is by uh, infrastructural changes. You know, it's difficult to walk and cycle. It's difficult to use public transport if the infrastructure is not there. So making sure that we make that infrastructure accessible it is a really important component of, of behavior change. And then there are the more individual approaches to behavior change. I mean, there's some nice experiments being done, for example, in, in canteens, in, in uh, cafeterias. We've actually done it a bit at the London School, although we haven't evaluated it very much. But we, we for example, pre-COVID, we our catering manager implemented the planetary pick. So every day you could choose a dish which had a low environmental footprint and was healthy. And if you put that forward, if you make it very easy for people to access it, then you find increasing numbers of people eat that kind of food and enjoy it. So there are all sorts of things that can be done at the kind of micro level as well. And the example that Serene showed of the Swedish schools, it was very interesting. These are primary school children and they um, implemented these quite radical dietary changes and they had no increase in food waste. They had no increase in criticism of the food at all. Um, so it was well accepted. So if you implement it in a way that's sensitive uh, to people's um, you know, beliefs and attitudes, and that example she gave, uh, Serene, you might want to emphasize this yourself, but that nice example of the um, work in Indonesia, which showed that if you really listen to people, listen to communities and understand why they're being uh, forced to often act unsustainably, then you can develop solutions with them rather than imposing them on them. Solutions have to be co-designed and co-implemented. They cannot be just imposed from outside. They will be resisted. Yes, I'd like to yeah. just add uh, Sorry, to that. Yes. Is the point that I concluded with at the end is, is about evaluations as well and, and trying to understand the reasons why things work or don't work in order for us to learn these lessons and implement things better next time. And that's where there's a lack right now in the evidence uh, because these kinds of evaluations, there's a lot of focus on impact, but not on, on process, not on implementation, not on what people think of what's happening so that you know exactly what it is that you need to address. So um, yeah, I think, I think we need to, to, to find the evidence and, and strengthen the evidence as well. And just to add to what Serene and Andy were saying, as Andy really started his point, we're locked in, in in our behavior patterns, in our kind of daily routines. And as behavioral scientists often say, um, the best opportunity for us to change some of these patterns is that when our own routines are changing for some other reason, for example, when we're moving house, when people are getting married, um, they 
already somehow have to essentially change their routines and that's a great opportunity to do something more sustainable and at, at, at an individual level but the same logic can be applied to the societal level so for example when we all started working from home that's a whole completely different routine so how do we now pick out from these changes the best patterns for our own behaviors at a larger scale at a societal scale that we can continue to be more sustainable and to also live in a more healthy way and how can we use it as a leverage for transformation much wider bigger transformation so even when we think about large-scale development projects in the cities how can we uh, use them as an opportunity, not only just as a change in structure, but also as an, or as an opportunity to change behaviors of the populations that are impacted by the new developments, et cetera. So we really have to think in this systems manner in terms of the leverage points and how can we transform uh, the way how we behave. Yeah, thank, thanks, Christine. Really important reflection there. And, and I think this is something that all of us have been you know, hoping for, and, and I think we should still not give up, but, but you know, that we, what are the lessons that we learn from the pandemic that we can use in support of, of this transition that we're now facing in terms of sustainability. And uh, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned there that uh, we're just uh, bouncing back to the pre-COVID unsustainable and uh, in many ways irresponsible lifestyles or behaviors but but let's see i mean that's the the jury is still out there we have 10 more minutes and uh, we are at cop uh, we're in the midst of the most important cop meeting uh, since paris so i'd like to really push you all of you on the panel with one question if we could take, take around having the reflections from each one of you on the same question namely so in my mind, we've had one and a half hours soon of the most important topic that connects closest to individuals in every culture, every geography around the world, how climate change is threatening the health and, and, and quality of life of fellow citizens in the world. I do not see anything of that in the negotiating corridors in the blue zone here in, in, in Glasgow. So my question to you is, what would you like to see as, um, as any, any evidence of, of a positive outcome in Glasgow in terms of the topics that we've been discussing on integrating health with climate change? What, what, would, what, what would you be, when you see the final statements coming out of Glasgow, what will you be looking for to, to check whether we're making any progress on, on the topic that we have been discussing uh, since since three o'clock uh, or two o'clock <laughs> this, this afternoon, if I may. Um, so, Peninha, would you like to start? You're on. You're closest to me on the on the screen here. Yeah, and it's a, it's a really good question, Johan. So, I, what would what would I like to see? I think any mention of health would be really good, but not just health on its own, but that, how health integrates in the economic sphere, in the environmental sphere, and in, in, in the business sphere. So not just health in isolation, because health doesn't work in isolation. So it's that whole integrated approach with health embedded across all the different perspectives. Thanks. And then I, I have Andy. And after Andy, it's Christine. So if you want to be a bit pre-warned. So Andy, please. Yeah, so it's, it's a fascinating question. I, I do think one would like to see a really explicit statement about the importance of protecting human health from climate change and would like to see the metric of human health trying to assess the impact of climate change on human health as really brought out as one of the ways in which we can monitor the success or otherwise of, of these discussions. And you know, we are, because of scientific advances, we now are in a much better position to be able to attribute health outcomes to climate change. So for example, we used to just be able to say, well, you know, heat will kill people. Of course, that's true. But we can now say that a particular heat wave or a heat event will cause a certain number of deaths and that the, the intensity and the, the frequency of those events has been increased by a certain amount as a result of climate change. So we're now in a much better position to put numbers in the future uh, on, the, on the health impacts of climate change. I'd like to see that built into the monitoring, if you like, of the impact of, the, of these COP discussions. 
The second point is about the issue we've been discussing just now, the benefits of moving towards a zero carbon economy. So I'd like to see every country, including health co-benefits in their nationally determined contributions when they file them under the Paris Agreement. They should be saying, well, these are the ways in which we aim to improve health as well as reducing greenhouse gas emissions. We commit to reducing our fossil fuel related air pollution by X, uh, promoting uh, healthy diets, uh, and increasing capacity potential for physical activity in our, particularly in our cities. So we could build in these metrics in, into, the, uh, into the NDCs. And then finally, I'd like to see more funding specifically to protect and promote health in climate adaptation and mitigation funding. At the moment, the um, institutions that fund adaptation and mitigation are largely unaware, or they, they choose to be unaware, of, of the health implications of what they're doing. And I would like to see that much more, given a much higher profile uh, in, the, um, in, in the kind of menu of activities that these big funding organisations um, undertake. So that should be explicitly built in, climate and health. Yeah, thanks. A, a lot of uh, a lot of really policy relevant inputs there. Th thanks a lot, um, Christine. Well, what I would really like to see from this COP is action. So once the COP is over, are we actually going to do what we are promising to do and what we're discussing? And as Andy already touched on, um, there should definitely be monitoring and evaluation mechanisms for the actions that are taking place, and. Uh, careful consideration about how do we maximize the health benefits of all climate change mitigation actions that we are implementing. So a transparent system for, um, for tracking what gets implemented, how it is implemented, and a very careful cross-sectoral uh, consideration of all um, health-related concerns of actions that are taking place, but of course also very uh, collaborative, interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary action um, so that we all work together to maximize all possible benefits for health, for, for the society and for the environment in the best way we can. No, wonderful. And I think, um, you know, everyone is, uh, is, is really screaming for action here, here in Glasgow. That, that's absolutely clear. I think that's, that's one of the key insights where I think the health climate agenda can also you know, rise very rapidly in prominence that we recognize we are at this action moment. This, this is the transformative point. This is the decade when we have to, you know, go from incrementality to exponential change, which has to be equitable and which has to be science-based. So I think, I think that the kind of action, action question will, will be coming up almost by the hour here. Uh, Serene. Uh, yeah, so I would like to see, as I think Andy already touched a bit, is a specific, very specific commitments, not lo just large statements, but things on what these governments are going to do, for example, to promote more plant and make available and accessible more plant-based diets. And what are they going to do to, to change the infrastructure of cities to, to improve, uh, to reduce uh, motorized travel and um, and also in engagement of local communities. I think that is that is really important. People people need, know what they're doing and why they're doing it, and um, and and these stories and these people need to be heard, so that we can come up with things that work for everybody. You can't have only top down approaches. You need to have bottom up approaches as well. Yeah, thank, thanks, Serena. I think that was a really good point to, to kind of round this incredibly rich dialogue up that we also need to anchor this with the social, cultural, local realities at community level, at the local scale. And I think that is a, a, good, a good place to, um, to round this off also because we are here in Glasgow setting the top-down framing uh, we have so far failed in, in delivering on that framing, but here's the moment to, to update all the pledges, all the promises, all, all the NDCs. And as Andy pointed out, uh, one proof point will be to what extent integrated health metrics are, are you know, pointed at present within the nationally determined contributions. Uh, I think that's a really good, good uh, measuring 
point for for Glasgow. Uh, I also think that we've covered, you know, so much evidence that, uh, you know, this is a scientific field, but we also have already so much evidence on the ground, not least uh, the the phenomenal steps taken in the in the cities sphere that you shared, Christine. Um, with regards to all the co-benefits from, from uh, mitigation, climate mitigation for health outcomes. With that, um, we're coming to the end of this session. I'd like to thank all of you. I'd like to thank all the participants for, for all your contributions. There's a very rich chat um, and, and a Q&A. We'll be logging all of those and feeding them right into the Pathfinder initiative project so so thanks for that this is this is not only kind of a session in general it's actually almost like part of a research project because uh, just your your inputs here uh, are really valuable into into the mapping uh, led by the team on the panel on the pathfinder initiative so with that i'd like to um, thank you all thanks for hosting this for the sustainable development solutions network and of course the great champions and experts at the london school of hygiene and tropical medicine thanks a lot and um, yeah keep up the great uh, work and for those of you who are in glasgow let's go out and uh, make climate and health an integral part of the policy outcomes thanks a lot goodbye there Thank you.